to uh, talk a little bit about secondary management of the traumatized nose. So, I mean, most of us are familiar with treating uh, acute nasal injuries, uh, often with a closed reduction or something along those lines. But this is really more specifically talking about what happens with those patients that um, either couldn't be treated initially or came to us after the fact. So um, really no disclosures other than I receive uh, an occasional honorarium from the AO. So what I'd like to do is to hopefully clarify some of the confusion about uh, the different types of osteotomies there, and then um, talk about building a strong nasal foundation, discussing some of the contour issues, and then just go through some cases. So when we think about the traumatized nose, there's several issues. We have deviations of the nasal axis, so shifting right and left. Uh, we have septal problems, and we have dorsal contour irregularities. So if you start to, to kind of compartmentalize uh, your physical findings in these different buckets, I think it really helps to simplify uh, your analysis and then creation of a treatment plan. So. You know, if you, if, you, if you think about the nose in third, we have the bony upper third, we have the cartilaginous uh, lower two thirds, and you can start to see how many different permutations or configurations of deviations there can be. So it really does help to start to analyze that and specifically look at the upper vault, the middle vault, and the lower vault, because if you have, um, deviations of the upper vault, the bony vault, then we're probably talking about osteotomies. If we have issues with the lower two thirds, then we may be talking about cartilage grafting or camouflage with grafts or any of a number of techniques to deal with that more mobile segment. So what I like to do is to use um, small curved guarded osteotomes. These osteotomes are uh, about two and a half millimeters uh, in width. And then I also have a two millimeter uh, unguarded osteotome that I'll use for uh, percutaneous uh, osteotomy. So I trained with Ted Cook. These were some osteotomes he had designed. Uh, so they're called the Cook osteotomes, but I like the feel. If you've ever used or seen a Nivert osteotome, you know, those are like four millimeters uh, in width. They have a huge guard. So they really do a lot of tissue trauma. So this, this helps to speed the recovery. So one of the things that I think is confusing for residents at times is uh, the lateral osteotomy. You know, we talk about a high-low high lateral osteotomy. Well, the first lateral osteotomy was actually a low-low osteotomy, and that's because it was performed with a Joseph saw. So an incision was made uh, at the head of the turbinate, and then a little saw was actually placed in there, and you would saw back and forth, and Therefore, there was really no way to control it. It was a straight, low osteotomy. What we're talking about is a high, low, high osteotomy. So that refers to the position of the osteotomy uh, in relationship to the dorsal height, if you think of it that way. So when we're inferior, we start high, and that preserves this little triangle of bone at the piriform aperture. Then we want to quickly drop low along the ascending process of the maxilla, because if you're still high there, you'll feel or see that step off. So that, that camouflages the osteotomy there. And then as we go more superior, we start to curve up into the nasal bone itself. So the majority of the lateral osteotomy is not even in the nasal bone. It's, it's along this ascending process of the maxilla. So again, preserves the airway, reduces the step deformity, and it refers to high, low, high, as in relationship to the dorsum. So the medial osteotomy occurs at the junction of the septum and the nasal bone, and it tends to fade back. And it's nice because it allows you to create a controlled back, back fracture. So, you know, we talk about times when you don't need to do that. So if you're doing a rhinoplasty and you've taken down a large hump, many times you've essentially created that osteotomy and you don't necessarily need to perform it. Although there are times when I've done dorsal reduction, uh, for example, in men with uh, really thick or heavy nasal bones, I will still perform uh, lateral or medial osteotomy after I, have, um, after I have done that hump reduction. But essentially that gives us that controlled back fracture. Now, intermediate osteotomies are sometimes a little bit confusing, con uh, confusing but I think of them as osteotomies that help to correct sidewall contour problems. 
So when you have one side of the nose, which is much longer than the other, these are super useful. If you have somebody that's had, uh, that has healed fractures and they have convexity of the nasal bones on the sidewall, you can go through that old fracture line, recreate that fracture line and help to eliminate that, uh, uh, that convexity, or as I mentioned here, to mobile, mobilize the malunions. But to do a medial osteotomy, you need stable bone. So what that means is you can do your medial osteotomy, then your intermediate, and then your lateral, or you can do your lateral, then your intermediate, then your medial, but you have to do this while you still have an attachment, either medial or, medial or lateral. And most people then would do, uh, many times I'll do the intermediate before I do either, os either osteotomy, then I'll do, do the subsequent um, osteotomies as I see fit. So this is just an example of a guy with a crooked nose these were palpable fracture lines. So this central segment was actually a little bit telescoped. And what I've marked here is where the bone inserts into the face. And I think, you know, especially starting off, if you'll make marks uh, on the outside of the nose, it will really help you uh, predict what you're going to find and what you need to address uh, with your osteotomies and your surgery in general. So this is another time when I would use intermediate osteotomies. So you can see how deviated her nose is to the right. So this right side is really a vertical nasal sidewall, but the left is much more sloped and laterally positioned. So you can see how much wider that insertion of that left nasal bone is than the right. So this is the perfect case to do osteotomies or uh, intermediate osteotomies. So you typically do the intermediate osteotomy on the longer side. So we have this vertical side on her right. We have this longer segment on the left, which is laterally positioned. And we do this cut, which allows us to, to try to even, uh, even that out. So here's a clinical example. Uh, this was a young girl who uh, had a childhood nasal injury. Um, I used an external approach. <laughs> You can see that she's much like that last patient with uh, the extreme deviation, um, asymmetrical insertions of uh, the nasal bone. And so this is kind of what I did here. I did an external approach in her case. I did a very small dorsal reduction. I did medial osteotomies. I did that lateral or the intermediate osteotomy again on that longer side, did lateral osteotomies, spreader grafts to support the middle ball, just conservative cephalic trim, and then I used a little uh, onlay graft over this left uh, upper lateral cartilage for camouflage. And so here she is post-op. You can see that uh, we've evened out the sidewalls quite a bit. We've added a little bit of width through the middle vault. Here she is on three-quarter view, a little bit of refinement in the uh, profile. And again, there you can see uh, the profile view. So strategically using these osteotomies really helps to improve uh, your uh, treatment of the crooked nose or the, the secondarily, uh, or the traumatized nose in a secondary fashion. And there's just her base, base view. So the other osteotomy that is super useful, uh, after I've done uh, those osteotomies, this is my next go-to if I'm still finding that I'm having trouble straightening the nose, and it's a dorsal percutaneous ostomy. So it's a transverse osteotomy, and what that does, it actually mobilizes that uh, bony pyramid. So it helps you to correct deviations of the perpendicular plate. So many times you'll have high um, bony septal deviations, and you just can't get things to move. So I'll take that two millimeter osteotome and actually go right through the skin, and I can either go um, directly over the radix, or if it's more of a one-sided issue, I can go uh, through the sidewall. And there uh, is a schematic on that patient I showed earlier of how I'm doing that to complete, the, complete that uh, mobilization of the pyramid. And I'm essentially, uh, you know, I, I leave the, I don't make an incision, uh, the osteotome sharp, so I use that to go directly through the skin, and then I just postage stamp it until I've uh, got the mobility that I need. And this does not require a suture or tissue glue or anything like that. You do need to hold uh, pressure uh, for a short period of time uh, just for hemostasis, but, but generally it's not too bad. So what about the middle vault? We talked about the bony vault. For middle vault deviations, um, there's a number of different ways to handle those. Uh, 
uh, you can do endonasal techniques, so spreaders, um, either a single spreader or asymmetric spreaders. So you can take advantage of varying uh, thicknesses of your spreader grafts to try to camouflage problems. And then you can also use on-lay camouflage grafts. And those can either be uh, crushed cartilage, they can be fascia. If you're doing a uh, rib graft, you can use the perichondrium off the rib. Um, any of number of things uh, are available for that. So this is a patient uh, who had a sporting injury. Uh, she has obstruction. She has the deviation of her nose to the left. And you can start to see again how much longer uh, this right side is and uh, obliquely oriented, oriented while the left one is much more vertical. She also disliked her profile. So she had just a little bit of a bump, but otherwise, you know, fairly nice nose. You can see her caudal septal deviation to the left, uh, contributing to her obstruction. And so in her case, I did this uh, with an endonasal approach. Uh, I, straightened, I straightened her septum. I did a dorsal reduction through an intercartilaginous incision. Um, I did the intermediate osteotomy on the right to help with that sidewall discrepancy. And then I placed a unilateral endonasal spreader on the left. And to do that, uh, the way it's typically done for me is I make my hemitransfixion incision. And then the very first thing I do is I'll create a pocket for a spreader high along the dorsum. And then I'll leave a little bridge of tissue and elevate the inferior aspect of the mucoparachyndral leaflet. And, and generally that works uh, really quite well. In more severe deviations, it's sometimes helpful to actually disarticulate the upper lateral cartilages from the dorsal septum to release all those intrinsic forces. But it's and I used, I would say I used to believe that was always necessary. And I don't think that is always necessary now, uh, but you can do that. So here she is postoperatively, she's still a little swollen, not perfectly straight, but a little straighter. And a little bit of improvement in the profile and straightening of her caudal septum. So uh, that's just another example of the types of things that we can do with a pretty straightforward procedure. Now, for severe middle vault deviations, as I was alluding to just a minute ago, that's where I'm going to use the external approach. We release those intrinsic forces between the septum and the upper lateral cartilage. And then I'll use cartilage grafting to really resupport the foundation of the nose. You know, the, the, the septum many times just, you know, you can score it, you can cross hatch it, you can do things like that. But in, in my experience, uh, that can be subtly helpful, but it really many times does not take care of it to the degree that we need to do. So I'll often use cartilage grafts as little battens or braces. So um, deviations of the L-strut, really the L-strut is what we're trying to uh, recreate. We want that to be straight. And you can see in this uh, image here how buckled this uh, septum is. So, you know, that's not something that can be addressed in the nasally. Um, so again, either uh, ethmoid bone or septal cartilage, or in some cases, uh, if they've had prior surgery, and rarely in primary cases, I'll use rib graft. So in this case, frequently what we're talking about is extended spreader grafts uh, and uh, caudal septal extension grafts. And this is from Dean Toriumi's paper back when he was describing the use of the caudal septal extension graft. And you can configure that in any number of orientations so that you can control rotation and projection. But it's a super powerful tool, and then your uh, extended spreaders can help to stabilize that. The other uh, kind of treatment up the ladder would be a caudal septal replacement, and that's you simply remove that area, uh, you find a new straight piece of cartilage, and you recreate that. And I would say I did that more uh, commonly uh, early on in my practice. I found that many times now I can uh, divide through the dorsal caudal junction. And even if I can preserve, say, a two or three millimeter segment of that dorsal strut, then I can add those ethmoid or septal cartilage battens. And I think it just, it helps you maintain the relationship of the tip more readily than if you're starting from scratch with a, uh, with a replacement. But sometimes you have to do it. And then also there's the extracorporeal septal reconstruction where you actually take the whole thing out, um, fashion a new piece, and then you suture uh, this into the uh, keystone area. Um, again, this is one of those times when, you know, things look a lot worse before they start to look better. So it can be done. 
And this is an example of a pretty robust reconstruction using ribs. So you can see this caudal septal extension graft is in position uh, here uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion. And then these uh, uh, big uh, spreader, extended spreader grafts. Uh, also, I refer to them as kind of an extended spreader slash batten graft. Here's our upper laterals that are then reattached over that complex, and then we'll start to reestablish uh, the tip. Another example of an S-shaped deviation, and uh, this was early on in my practice, but again, I found it really helpful to mark out uh, what I was seeing. And you can see from the base view just how deviated uh, that, that septum is. I think one little trick when you're trying to decide whether you can just trim the caudal septum and reposition it on the max free crest or when you actually need to, to use an external approach, um, a really helpful test is to actually you know, put your gloves on and palpate that caudal septum. If there's a slight bend, many times you can do that endonasally just with a septoplasty approach. But if you feel a vertical buckle or an old break, I think almost always in those circumstances, I recommend uh, or I'll typically choose at that point to go with an external approach. So here you can see what we were looking at through the nostril, this uh, severe deviation here, actually an overriding uh, fracture uh, of the septum in this area. And essentially I've removed this piece, I'm starting to try to look for uh, a clean piece of cartilage, a straight piece. And what I ended up doing was fashioning um, batten grafts from a piece of uh, septum here, this was that other piece of uh, cartilage uh, that I used for the caudal replacement. So caudal replacement here, these batten slash spreader grafts are placed. You can see they're a little bit below the dorsum. So that's why I typically, that's why I would refer, refer to these more as, as battens than traditional spreaders. And then uh, here she is postoperatively with a straighter configuration, um, not a whole lot of change in the dorsum. Um, still a little bit of a deviation maybe to the right, but she was notably uh, improved with her breathing. Well, what about dorsal contour? You know, we have issues where we have over projection or under projection, uh, under projection. So for reduction, you know, we can use things like the rumen osteotome and rasp and, uh, you know, sequentially uh, take down uh, that bony problem. Uh, for augmentation, uh, I find that septal cartilage is probably my favorite. Uh, but ear cartilage will work, uh, and rib cartilage uh, is tried and true for uh, more severe deformities. So, you know, if we think about saddle nose or uh, dorsal depressions, they come in varying degrees or grades. And so if we have just a, a little super tip depression like this, you know, she presented to me complaining of a bump. And that's where we have to really rely on our analysis, because what she has is this super tip depression or her her bony dorsal height is actually pretty good. But I will sometimes use spreader grafts uh, that are a little bit taller and actually place them above the height of the dorsal plane and then reattach the upper lateral cartilages to that. And then um, can use a caudal septal extension graft to fail out retractions. You can see she has this acute nasal labial angle. So we need to do something uh, to work on that area. So. This is how those uh, uh, grafts would be placed above the height of the dorsum in this area here. And then a little plumping graft, uh, I believe, was what I used uh, in uh, the nasolabial angle. But for more severe depressions, typically I'm, I'm going to use a rib graft. And so uh, for years I've, I've carved, uh, you know, these canoe-shaped um, uh, grafts. Sometimes I'll thin it out where it rests on the bone, leave it a little bit more prominent down below and then tuck it in underneath the, um, underneath the lower lateral cartilages. You can see some warping of these. The other thing you have to be careful about is beveling these edges because if the sides of these uh, on-leg grafts don't match with uh, your upper laterals and your nasal bones, then over time what happens is you get contraction and you can see this sitting as a little sausage on top of the nose. This is an example of a, a patient who um, actually was riding her Harley and lost control, uh, hit a tree and uh, was seen elsewhere. And so she's presenting here about a week out. Uh, you can see she has this severe uh, nasal orbital ethmoid fracture. Um, she has fractures of her rims. Uh, 
and so, you know, this is something where we're not going to be able to do the straightforward uh, nasal reconstruction. We need to start thinking more of our, our trauma principles. You can see the, the big separation here, widening of her canthus. Uh, she's inferiorly positioned on this left side. She's got lacerations everywhere. The one thing that was nice is that she had this laceration here. So we discussed, you know, the classic way you would do this would be to uh, do a coronal approach, um, do trans uh, nasal wiring for the canthi and uh, treatment of your, uh, of your nasal orbital ethmoid fracture with or without bone grafts. And then typically add a non-lay uh, bone graft to support the bridge. But we kind of worked through that and I felt like I could get the NOE improved through the existing laceration. So in her case, um, we didn't do that. We did this all through her laceration. Uh, and then uh, this is her shortly after. You can see, you know, yes, her, her bridge is low. Um, and, you know, you might argue that, well, if we'd done that on leg graft at the time, we'd be in a better position. Because the argument for doing it primarily is that you start to have soft tissue contraction and once you have that contraction, it's really difficult to go back and get the dorsum uh, where you want it. But um, this was her uh, after she had healed um, further. And you can see, you know, she still has some asymmetries in her eyes, but it's better. Uh, the nose is relatively straight. Her scar is starting to heal, but you see this low radix. And so, you know, she also is foreshortened. So I probably could have prevented that if I'd done, done something at the time. But, you know, what we decided to do in her case was just to do uh, an endonasal revision. Um, she was overall fairly satisfied, so we did some radix grafting. I actually reduced a little bump uh, at her rhinion, revised her um, scar. But as I, as I mentioned, you know, we missed that primary opportunity uh, to, to really put that solid foundation down. And so this was her pre-op and this was her, oh, I don't know, a year and a half after um, all of her surgeries had been performed. And, you know, still a little bit of uh, uh, globe issue on the right. She'd had some issues with her uh, retina though, and, and we really felt like it wasn't wise to go back in and do any additional surgery. And, you know, we've made a little bit of improvement uh, to her profile, still foreshortened, but she, she was okay with that. Here's another example, uh, unrestrained uh, patient in a motor vehicle crash. Uh, again, severe uh, nasal orbital ethmoid, uh, mid-face fracture. She had a ruptured globe on the right. And this would be the more classic example. So here we're using a cranial bone graft that's been contoured. It's a split thickness bone graft. It's secured uh, to the glabella uh, with some plates. And then I think in her case, we were actually able to do hers through uh, are, we still did a coronal for the bone graft, but again, this laceration, if you ever have it, can really help you in, in uh, uh, improving things. And this was her a number of, um, uh, well, I guess she's about a year there uh, before she's had her uh, ocular prosthesis constructed. Um, dorsum still a little bit low if you look at it critically, but, but better. And then, uh, one other uh, severe type injury, this was an industrial conveyor belt uh, injury, uh, severe uh, orbital injuries. Uh, you can see the zygoma uh, malposition. Uh, he was totally obstructed on uh, his right side and asked that we uh, try to help him. You can see how low his dorsum is. You can see the external valve collapse as well as the septal deviation uh, on base view. And so in this uh, situation. We did a septoplasty, a dorsal uh, rib graft, uh, articulated uh, a columellar strut and a little notch uh, there to provide a, a L strut foundation. Did a rim graft on uh, the right to help support that external valve and some dome suturing. And then secondarily, uh, I did a, a ZMC repair uh, by osteotomi osteotomizing everything and then repositioning his uh, zygomatic complex. And so this is him after uh, that rhinoplasty uh, and the zygoma re repositioning. So again, if we look at this critically, um, you can see how we're starting to see a little bit of contraction along that rib graft. Same thing is true with your, with your uh, calvaryl bone grafts. You can see that over time. Three-quarter view and then his profile view. <laughs> 
face view with an improved airway and a more triangular shaped uh, tip. So in summary, I think it's really important to do a good nasal, nasal analysis, break the nose down into thirds, think about that upper bony vault is something that you're probably going to need to address with osteotomies, although occasionally you can uh, use some rasping uh, on the lateral aspect for uh, subtle issues. And then in the middle third, in the lower and the tip as well, we're typically thinking about cartilage grafting to strength, uh, straighten and strengthen uh, that area. And then, you know, we may add uh, some camouflage grafts as well. But it's one of those things where we have to not only think about our tr management of trauma principles, we have to also have to think about our rhinoplasty principles. You know, one last thing I would touch upon um, for the dorsal augmentation that, that uh, I've used some, but not a whole lot, would be the diced cartilage uh, onlay graft. And that's something that uh, many people argue is less likely, you can contour it a little bit better, and many people would argue that it's less likely to um, get you in a situation where you have that soft tissue envelope contracting uh, around the edge. So I think I'll stop there, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Welcome. Quick question about when you use those septal battens, I've done it a couple times and I've had some patients complain about nasal obstruction afterwards. Do you ever have that issue or how are ways you kind of avoid that? I, mostly in really narrow noses, I think. Yeah, I, I've, I typically will thin them down quite a bit. I think if, if somebody has a particularly narrow nose, then I'd probably think about using the uh, ethmoid plate. Uh, and then when I'm doing that, you know, the challenge with the ethmoid plate is it's a little bit harder to get your sutures uh, through and through. I'll typically use an 18 gauge needle um, and drill some holes on the back table and then just pass it through in multiple places. So that's a reasonable way to deal with the narrow nose. But in some of the narrow noses, I find that um, they actually need some extra width in the middle vault in the form of a spreader. And you know, so I guess I haven't, I have seen it, um, but I haven't seen it to be a huge issue. The, the other thing that you can do is to, to not take them all the way down uh, to the very caudalmost aspect of the septum. So if you can stabilize the strut and then uh, at the distal end, uh, taper them in, so you have the substantial strength up above, but then you thin it down so you don't get any issues below, um, I think those are a few strategies that I've used. Great, thank you. That was a great talk. Awesome. Sometimes we get some uh, questions in the chat or Q and A. Um, don't see any right now, but keep an eye on those. Well, if anybody if anybody thinks of questions afterwards. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, it's dcreet, K-R-I-E-T, at K-U-M-C dot E-D-U, and I'd be happy to answer anything uh, that you think of about this or other topics. Well, thank you very much. All right, everybody have a great day and stay safe. Thanks. All right, bye-bye.